Hello, hello. Welcome to season four of Philippine X and Wellness. Thank you all so much, really, just for being a part of our Philippine X and Wellness podcast journey. We can't thank you enough for tuning in and really being a part of just this transformative journey around talking, listening, and healing. Um, we also want to thank, you know, our Philippine X supporters. You don't have to be Philippine X or Filipino to listen or view any of our episodes. A lot of times what we talk about in wellness also relates to you wherever you're at, whatever you identify. So you are also welcome to. I wanted to mention there are some changes in season four. We've taken out our break track. So we wanted you to still continue supporting our Philippine ex Filipino musicians and artists out there. Thank you all so much who have given us your consent to feature your music. We hope that as a community that you continue to purchase their music, go to their shows and support them because without art, you know, that's just another avenue of wellness for many of our community, our creative outlets as well. I want to make sure that we honor that even though we are uh, moving from that format and having those break songs. Uh, we are also wanting to introduce you to our first episode of season four. We're interviewing Emerald Rubio, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist. And we are going to talk about a very serious topic in our community, healing from sexual trauma in observance of sexual assault awareness and prevention month. I wanted to, before you start this episode, to go over a trigger and content warning. I wanted to let you all know that this episode is created for adult audiences only. We are going to talk about trauma, sexual abuse, and assault. So please take a break between the episode when you need to take your own um, wellness breaks Take notice of what you're feeling emotionally and physically in your body. If if you can't complete the episode, we will honor that and where you're at. Um, we also have time frames at the end of in the captions of YouTube. So if you want, you can also see those topics and you can also choose what you would like to focus on in the episode and also what to avoid. But we wanted to let you know that this is a very sensitive topic for many people that will be listening. So without further ado, please prioritize yourself first. Look into the resources that we have in our Instagram highlights that will help you navigate your own wellness and mental health journey as we address these sometimes very difficult and deep and personal, personally intense topics, okay? Um, otherwise, we hope that you also grow in wellness with us through this episode. Maayong Adlao! Welcome back to Philippine Ex and Wellness's initial episode of Season 4. We are continuing this season with additional episodes around health and wellness topics for and by our Philippine Ex Filipino community, inclusive of our larger community of supporters. Thank you for watching and listening out there. I am your host, Cheryl Sampson Ramirez, and my pronouns are she, her, sha. Following our Season 3 finale and Abilities Advocacy with Roque Bukton, we will be talking with licensed marriage and family therapist Emerald Rubio about healing from sexual trauma in observance of Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. Before we jump in, a note on our content. This episode is created for adult audiences only. We advise our viewers and listeners to exercise discretion as we discuss trauma, 
sexual abuse, and assault. It might be a lot to take in, so if you need a breather, take a break or pause the episode before continuing further in order to help apply healthy boundaries. Please check the show notes on our YouTube channel for more detailed descriptions to avoid sections that may be triggering. Please take care of yourself, and if you need to, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. We have resources in our Instagram highlights, and hopefully you will find what you need there. As mentioned in previous episodes, all views discussed are for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to be medical advice. Always consult with your healthcare practitioner for your particular condition, especially before starting any exercise or new health program. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Emerald Rubio. Welcome, Emerald. Thanks for having me, Cheryl. It's an honor that you would even invite me into your space. So thank you so much. Well, we're honored to have you and just to have you share your story with us. So Emerald, we typically like to start by knowing where our, our guests are from. Let's start with where are both sides of your family from and where are you currently streaming from? Okay, so um, well, both of my family, so on my father's side, he's from central Luzon. And so he's in a province called Zambales. They would say that's like the Santa Cruz of the Philippines. It's just, it's nice. There's a lot of beach towns, a lot of palenques, and I love it there. I I don't, when I go to the Philippines, I don't go, I don't like to go to the big cities. I like to go to the provinces. I like to go where the rice fields are. So that's where my family's at. My mom, she's mm. in Central Luzon, um, in Tarlac. And so there's a lot of farmland, rice fields. There's, you know, there's a pond in the backyard where the tilapia is. There's coconut trees. And so that's more my jam when I get to go back home. And I'm right now I'm streaming from San Jose. Uh, people will call that, you know, the Silicon Valley, the Bay. Um, and so it's like tech town. Um, mm-hmm. And my, my, I'm Emerald and my parents are she and her. Awesome. Yeah, no, I get it. My my parents are also from the province and I, I'm with you. The, it just seems like the pulse is in the province, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, that's, that's kind of my dream of where it can just like reside. Because it's so good for your natural, you know, your central nervous system. Like I, I like, I actually like slow peace living. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. So now that we know your lineage and where you're based, Emerald, let's dive into the topic at hand: healing from sexual trauma. This is a heavy and very sensitive topic for many. So, Emerald, what is your personal story, and what got you on the path towards healing from sexual trauma? Oh my goodness. Um, so I, I, I'm the eldest of five. And, um, if you can imagine being in a household of five girls, um, immigrant, well, you know, mother and father, and also it was multi-generational. So we always had people in the house, whether it was like grandparents, extended family. And so it, it was quite like the hustle and bustle life to have a mortgage and five kids. And then also to, to support, you know, the collective support people who are whoever's um you know in the household and mm-hmm. so that that was a heavy toll on my parents and you know I, I grew up where there there was a lot of domestic violence and so they didn't really handle you know their stress really well there's a lot of domestic violence in the in the home um a mm-hmm. lot of that physical abuse that came you know trickled down towards us a lot of emotional abuse that we had to endure and because they literally came from the mindset like you just have to make it happen very hustle and bustle go 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 um and that's how it is in the bay and so we had to you know we had to we had a lot of babysitters there were cousins aunties and uncles and most of them were very safe for the most part but really you know we had an uncle that lived with us for about 12 years you know i was age um you know from zero to 12 he lived with us and it was you know um my my dad's cousin and he just he seemed like the fun uncle like the uncle that would bring us to mcdonald's to bring us to happy hollow the parks that would bring you to south swimming but it just got really unsafe where he started to groom us and unknowingly groom my me and my two other sisters for how many different years and you know to the point where we actually got to 
get gain our justice as of last month. I can't believe it's going, it's going to be a month. So, you know, we got to gain justice from the things that he did to us 30 years ago. So, Emerald, if, if I may, um, I wanted to ask, so to clarify, you, were you were born in the U.S.? Yeah, so I was born in the U.S. My parents immigrated here when they were in their teens. Okay, and then, um, so when, um, in what um, age range are you now? Right, so. I'm, I'm proud. I'm, I'm 38. <laughs> we turned 39 in two months. Okay, just yeah. to get like the, the idea of also the ages that you're referring to. And then, and then also maybe could, um, could you define for our community what grooming is? I mean, grooming is when someone just gradually tries to uh, press those boundaries, you know, for a certain agenda. So for us, he was mm -hmm. grooming us so that he was able to fulfill his own, you know, his own sexual desires. And that's just, it, it's wrong. It's unsafe. It's inappropriate. It's a crime. And so, you know, it started off like, you know, at by the age of seven, it started off like like tickle bites and, um, you know, kind of grazing over our body when we're in the, you know, when the, in the swimming pool. And then it just got slowly more aggressive where, okay, I'm trying to take a shower or a bath. And then right after I get out of my bath, he's pulling me into his room so that he could help me lotion my body. But I could, I'm seven, I could do this myself. And so I remember so vividly all these different boundaries that, that I would try to set with them. Like, no, I could do it myself. I don't, I don't need your help. And he would continue to insist on these things. And mm. so it just, it was so confusing to have this man, you know, just kind of fondle over you. And, you know, by age eight, he just, he, he was so conniving. Um, you know, in our home, I was either dodging physical abuse for my dad or the emotional daggers for my mother mm -hmm. and so if I had to choose that being beaten and berated over you know hiding out in my uncle's room so I could do my homework that's that's what I chose mm -hmm. and so you know second third year, year old um you know grade emerald that's the choice that I had to make and I didn't think like okay if I go if I do my homework in my uncle's room I'm gonna be sexually molested that wasn't my thought I just wanted to be safe from being beaten with hangers and you know whatever object that they decided to use and yeah. you know he he used that as an opportunity to try to set this mood it was just really creepy um you know he would play love songs in the background or right after homework he would like try to he would pull me onto the blankets to to fondle me and caress me and molest me and, you know, at that point, I'm like, I'm I'm just frozen. I don't know what the heck is happening or what's going on. So I'm literally just frozen. But I'm also terrified because this man is, you know, I'm seven and he's, well, yeah, he's, he's, he's 20. He's like late 20s. So it's terrifying. Like, how do I even begin to stand, my, stand up for myself now? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it became a daily thing where it was like, you know, during the times that I was there doing homework, he used that time to okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull her into my blankets, cuddle with her, and just start to fondle over her, you know, uh, over and under her clothes. And so this was something that became like a very sick norm, you know, like his little daily escapades with me. Um, mm -hmm. What was really terrifying was when you know he became so bold and to. Um, where it became like night escapades. So he would carry me out of my bedroom and I shared her bedroom with, you know, all my sisters, there's two bunk beds. And so he, I, and I slept on the bottom one. And so he would carry me into his room and I could still, I remember, I, I remember my toes dragging along the, you know, the textured walls. I remember waking up under the, the mothballs, you know, smell. And the, it was like a musty blue and yellow blanket. Um, there are times I would wake up and I, it, I could just feel this erection on me. Um, the most mm -hmm. terrifying experience was I, like, I was asleep and I opened my eyes and I saw that my, you know, I've been, I'm fully naked and I have, you know, 
my legs are spread and I see his, his face like one inch away from my private parts with a flashlight. And then so no one, no one prepped me on what to do in those situations. So I'm, you know, whenever these, whenever I would wake up to these instances, I would just kind of like clench my whole body. I would move around to try to stop whatever he was doing, but it didn't seem to stop. And what was angering was that I saw, I mean, as a therapist now, I saw all the signs like you're obviously being abused and you don't see it. You don't see that your third or fourth grade child is wetting the bed. Um, you don't see that she's literally screaming all over the house and having night prayers and trying to escape through, you know, the windows and the doors. And so it just, you know, I had to do my own healing work of forgiving my parents because they really had no idea, you know, immigrant Filipino families they weren't taught, hey, what are the red signs of what to look for when your daughters are being molested? Like, they didn't know. They were just busy surviving. And so I endured that, like these daily things and nightly things. And it just, it made it really confusing. Like, what, what is, what does safety even mean? What does love even mean? Because here's this man who's doing this to me. And at the same time, he's saying, I love you, right? I love helping you, right? Do you love me, right? And so, and I think those are words I did not hear from my parents. They didn't tell me that they loved me. And it's not that they didn't. It's just that they didn't express it. So, you know, it, it just really distorted this whole idea of what love, safety, security, and boundaries were. And so it, all of this mess did not even begin to decrease until he started dating. So when I hit middle school, he started dating someone and, you know, um, it, it, it started to kind of dwindle down to like a little fondle over, you know, just in passing, maybe like a graze over my chest, but it wasn't as nearly as, as, um, just as traumatizing it was, you know, being, being trapped in his room and having to endure all these disgusting things, all these crimes. And so it, that part of my life ended at the age of 12 when he moved out. And I thought, that really was the end of it like I I could heal you know I could move on I could heal now and so like as I was writing this and I was as I was reflecting on it I really was like in this whole fond response I kind of just went along because I was really scared and so when I hit middle school I was just in this whole freeze response I became such a turtle shell of myself I mean if you had met that girl like who I was before all of this happened I was so silly I was playful I loved learning I love reading I was a top student and then all of a sudden like I'm barely getting by with like B's C's and D's and I'm literally dissociating all of class in middle school I can't keep up with six classes I don't know what the heck is going on and I'm falling further and further behind and I'm just you know feeling so depressed and I I, I just get to this point where like I, I have so much self-hatred because I feel ashamed I feel disgusted and I feel dirty and I just I felt really just confused and, you know, and then something starts to outbreak because when these things happen, it's not just like, you know, mental manifestations, but you can also get physical symptoms. So for me, I was always constipated. Um, I, you know, I used to have eczema just on the crevices on my arms, but then now I start to get eczema like all over my face, my, my neck, um, all over my arms, all over my legs. And this was not something that I dealt with. And so like, not only am I dealing with my own shame about what happened and I don't even know how to process it because there's nobody to talk to. Mm -hmm. I have to deal with the physical manifestations that I have rashes all over my body. So mm -hmm. here I am this, you know, scared middle schooler and I just don't want to be seen and I don't want to be heard. And so I don't talk. And I, I just remember, you know, I would just, I would wear my big baggy black hoodies and just I would look down and I, sometimes I didn't even cover my face because I was just that ashamed. And um, unfortunately, you know, with a lot of the poor boundaries that were happening in the house, mm -hmm. you know, um, I had a grandmother who watched soft core, you know, I don't know why she did it, but it was, a, I'm sorry, but that's hella Boston so scrum. I know she's like in heaven right now, but like that's hella Boston. <laughs> She watches like soft core porn or like those rated NR videos 
from Long Buster. I'm like, this is so nasty. I don't know why you're watching this. Was she, was you know, she related to your your uncle? Yeah, she was. Oh. Uh, so, I, but I love her. But I, I just remember, mm-hmm. like, she had that. And then mm-hmm. my dad had pornography. And mm-hmm. I think I just started to find an outlet towards pornography. And that's, you know, it, it kind of started this whole, like, 12 year addiction where I would use pornography as a way to like release and just have some sort of, you know, comfort because I didn't know, I didn't know how to mm-hmm. cope with any of this. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're seven years old and your uncle does this disgusting, ongoing, chronic crime towards you. And it just yeah. distorts everything, it distorts reality on so many different levels. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I've, I found that open door through pornography. And um, I just quietly, in silence, dealt with it. And, uh, you know, when I hit high school, I, I kind of went shifted into, like, you know, I went from fawn mode, and then I went to freeze mode, and I'm just going to deal with it by myself. Like, <laughs> you know, and I just, there was just, I remember even in middle school, just not wanting to, not wanting to look at myself, um, feeling so shame of when I had my period. Like, I just, I... I had so much shame about just being a, a person, a woman. And so in high school, I got tired of it. Like, I'm I'm tired of being the quiet girl. I don't want to be the quiet girl. And, you know, that's when I got into, like, fight mode and flight mode. And I just became, like, this rebel. And education was not a priority for me. In fact, my number one priority was, like, I better snag someone. I don't care who it is. If it's a girl or if it's a guy. Like, I just need someone to rescue me. And so with every person that I was with, you know, I became such a chronic relationship jumper at age 14. Once I hit ninth grade, like if I'm just good enough and if I'm if I just like behave enough, if, I, if I'm like more as eccentric enough, maybe one of these families are going to adopt me. And it's kind of silly to think, but like that's that's what I thought. Like that's my mindset. And so, you know, I ran away a lot. And, you know, when the relationships didn't work out, I felt such rejection you know, and I became very, very su- suicidal. I, it went from like porn to now, like now I'm, I'm having suicidal ideation and I'm having a lot of self harm. And then I'm running away to the next person. Like who's going to give me even just a crumble of attention so that I can see if they'll want me. And I just, all I wanted, you know, all I wanted was just to feel loved. I just, I just wanted someone to love me. I just wanted to feel safe. And I wanted you know, I just wanted to belong to someone and I wanted to have like that safe home environment. And so it wasn't until like my 20s, you know, that's what at this time. And so this whole time, I'm not dealing with any of the sexual trauma. I'm in fact, I'm just getting into even more sexual trauma because, you know, all this relationship jumping and running away, you know, I found myself getting into even uh, different types of rapes. If I'm going on a first date with someone and then I would get raped, um, I would meet someone at school and I, w- I decided, OK, let I'll go to your house. I don't want to go to my house. Why? Why would I go to my house? It's not safe. So I'll go to your house and then, you know, then experience being drug and, you know, drugged or um, I'm drinking. And I now I can't even I don't have any the, the inhibition to even make a choice. And it's just so I found myself in these types of situations or hey, I need a ride home because I ran away and what can I exchange or what can I offer you so I can get a ride home because I don't want to get beat when I get home. And so I I didn't really know how to make a safe choice. I just, I was just trying my best to survive the situation. And so in my 20s, you know, when I met, like my husband now, we've been together since we were 20. Um, but he, you know, it, like all these, co- you know, little different way, maladaptive ways that I've coped, they were just only making it, it was only prolonging my my healing process. And so, you know, he introduced me to the world of like drugs and raving and partying and alcohol and all of that. And that just, oh my goodness, that just covered everything even more. And, you know, the very thing that I was trying to run away from, I was trying to run away from a home that was unsafe. I was trying to run away from all the domestic violence. I was trying to run away from all these creepy people that didn't know how to respect those boundaries, you know, and then I found myself emulating the very thing I was trying to run away with. So I, 
became aggressive in my relationships. And it was just a very domestically violent, you know, relationships that I would have or, you know, having poor boundaries. Well, you know, and the men, the Filipino men in my life, you know, I saw abusers. I saw cheaters. I saw people who were aggressive. I saw people who didn't know how to respect boundaries. And so that became manifest into my life where, um, yeah, like having intimacy and you're just emulating porn, but it's not real intimacy because you're just going through the motions and you're pretending to be someone else that you're not. So you're not really being connected, right? Or having poor boundaries. Well, I'm mad at you, so I'm just going to go to the club or I'm mad at you. I'm just going to go do drugs. I'm mad at you. So I'm just going to go talk to some other people on the DMs. You know, doing things and doing things that I saw all throughout my life growing up. And what really finally, you know, my rock bottom where I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. I was when I was 28. So about, yeah, 10 years ago, actually it was 2013 around this time. Um, I made decisions that I lost my friends. I lost my family. I lost my kids for 24 days. You know, I, I made decisions that just destroyed all of that. And at the time I was so bitter because I felt like I'm just, you know, everyone's rejecting me. They don't understand me. They just want to leave me. But really that became the biggest blessing in my whole healing journey because finally I was able to just be alone with myself and to find safe communities that could help me along the way. And so that was like the, my biggest wake up call to finally look myself in the mirror and I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be aggressive. I don't want to be abusive. I don't want to just give my body because that's what I think I need to do to get love. Like, I don't, I want to just, if I, I want to have intimacy where it's, where we get to be, you know, it's collaborative, where we both have a choice, where it feels good, where it feels connected, not because it's transactional. You know, I just want people, I want to feel unconditionally loved as I'm growing and as I'm healing. And so it was through that. I mean, so before 28, I had, you know, my healing journey was like, it was like very short spurts, short spurts of school counseling, short spurts of community agency, you know, short spurts of Kaiser. And then, you know, I had a season of going to like Incest Anonymous um, because I, I was just really desperate. Like I didn't know like what else I could turn to. Right. And so um, I think. It just, I, I had this big like shift, like once I started to do the work because I, and this is not because, oh, I, I'm doing the work because someone told me to, it's like, I really, I was so desperate. I didn't want to be this person anymore. And so I, I got myself in, it's, it's called Granowski Center. And it essentially, it's like a counseling center that was at Palo Alto University. And it was through that journey that I'm like, I'm ready. I want to. My therapist asked, like, what do you want to do? Like, you know, you're a single mother, you're in transition, this fork in the road. Like, what do you want to do? And I looked at him like, I want to do what you're doing. I want to, I want to help people. I'm like, I know I'm not there yet, but I just, I, I want to. I, I, I kind of realized like through everything that I've been through, you know, um, it was like a tick mark of, okay all the things that I get, like, I didn't read it in a book. Like, I literally lived through it. Like, I remember, you know, being in 5150. I remember getting taken away from the cops so I can go get assessed. I remember being in a group home and realizing, like, I don't like this system. I remember at age 17, I don't like this system. I, I want to I wanna create a better system. When I get to the other side, I want to do it different. And so it just became this full circle moment like okay I got that dream when I was age 17 that I I wanted to become a therapist now I'm 30 like I think I want to like take this jump and do it and so when I went into grad school I call it like well it is the most expensive therapy that you'll ever receive because man you were just opening up all the boxes like every single class and so there are times where I'm just like literally crying in class and then I'm like trying to process it with my husband and my kids and my friends I'm like <laughs> You know, um, and like learning, like learning how to, I just, when I went to grad school, like, I can't believe all the things that I didn't like have access to that I didn't understand. Like, yeah, I know that. no, totally. You learn all these things. 
Emerald, do you mind if we take a a, a pause? Yeah. Wait, first let's take a breath. Because... Who? <sighs> I'm going to go back and circle back to your grad school point. But I also want to just take take a pause because um, there are also members of our community that are listening to your story and also members of our community that are not in clinical practice. <laughs> so I, I, if I can just draw some clarifying questions yeah. um, for the rest of our community. So because earlier on, you mentioned like night terrors. Can you maybe explain when you were a child what night terrors were for maybe people that maybe have an idea, but they're not quite sure? Yeah, I, so night terror are these nightmares, like they're not just like sleeping in your bed. Usually people are acting things out. And the thing is like, people don't always remember that they're acting things out. And so in my mind, what I remember was I had a reoccurring nightmare where I'm like essentially falling from the, like this white sky and then my mm-hmm. body drops and it, and it's like all that like circle, you know, like it's like a circle wooden um, spinning contraption. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm feeling so dizzy and nauseous because it's spinning and spinning and my arms and my legs are trapped Mm -hmm. and I can't get out. Yeah. Um, But on the other side of it, my mom, my dad were telling me like, you don't remember trying to jump out the window. You don't remember trying, I tried to like hold you back because you tried to run out the door. You don't remember you screaming. And I, I don't. I don't remember so, any of that. So this is when you were fully asleep that you were experiencing these? Yeah. Moments? Okay. So this was between fourth and fifth grade, which made sense because that's when the, you know, the, the sexual trauma that I endured became more intense because it mm-hmm. was on a daily basis and then he was pushing things to the night. And so... Uh, there's two. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. You also mentioned 5150. Can you uh, also... Um, explain to our community yeah. what is the fifty one fifty. Yeah, so that's um, so if there's any if anyone is uh, showcasing any safety concerns, whether it's like uh, su- you know suicidal thoughts, um, homicidal threats, or just any anything where your your safety is being, uh, they want to do like a three day psychiatric hold, and sometimes that can be longer. You know, they're really when you go into these places. Um, they're looking to see, well, can you keep yourself safe or do you have, are you going to be a threat to the community? So are you, are you going to be a threat to yourself or the people around? Mm-hmm. Okay. And in case people are listening and they might know someone that's in a similar like position where, um, is there a number that you uh, might want to recommend for 5150? Yeah. I mean that easiest one uh i mean i know that they have they have the suicide hotline for 988 um but really mm-hmm. people you know people can voluntarily like let i know that you know if you really feel like you're not you're not able to keep yourself safe you can voluntarily um bring yourself to the to the hospital and tell them what you're what you're thinking and that you need that extra help you know or you could let a family member know so that they're able to take you there Okay, no, thank you. I wanted to take a pause and mention those important pieces just because I feel like those were really pivotal points in your upbringing um, that our community should be aware of in case they know someone that's experiencing the same. So thank you for allowing me to take that pause and just clarifying some of those important points that you are sharing with us. So I want to bring it back also um to now you're in grad school now you're really you're mentioning learning all the this terminology all of these concepts all of these theories and and interventions right around what you might have experienced so where where would you like to take it from there i mean at at that point um Gosh, as hard as grad school was, because it was a five-year journey, like, I'm so thankful for it because then it helped me to, like, create a groundwork on how to create safety, you know, when I am working with people because one of the biggest is insecurities. Like, I remember even, like, raising my hand and telling the whole class of, like, I don't, 
how how can I be a therapist? Like, I don't have boundaries. And you want me to teach other people to have boundaries? Like, I don't have a boundary, you know? And um, there's a lot of, like, chuckles and laughs because there's a lot of people that also resonate like that. So in the Bay Area, there's, it, it's hella diverse. So it was such a colorful classroom. And so a lot of us, we're all, you know, survivors of all types of different traumas. And so <laughs> right. them could relate and we're, we're in good company. And so we got to do a lot of practice around that. Like, how do you, how do you begin to assert what you need? How do you um, become so real about what you want for your life, what you want in your relationships, what you want in your friendships? Like what? Now you have a choice. Like that's crazy. And so all these things that it got to learn, like, well, you, you can have choice in how, like the people around you or your career or your beliefs or yeah or, agency it's just a wild concept you know you don't have to sell for what is given like you actually can choose I so that that was you know an exciting revelation that i got like during um during grad school and i i, I do use those concepts like in my healing circles because a lot of them they don't know like survivors don't know that they can have a choice to say no or they can end a friendship or a relationship or a job and so it's that was that was really monumental for me in grad school so those were some transformative years for you when we talk about your healing from these sexual experiences but yeah. also you know boundaries it sounds like also were not clearly defined for you as a child right um we're looking at this i'm looking at and thinking about this generation of my friends raising their kids where they're even teach they're teaching their kids consent right mm -hmm. and even can consent around can you post a picture of them on social media right or when we give our relatives kisses on the cheeks or give them hugs you can tell them that you don't want that if, if you are not feeling comfortable. You know, I experienced that with my um, friend's kids recently. And while um, I was initially shocked because that's not something culturally that I'm used to, I actually respected that they were teaching their kids that to vocalize consent, you know, in the in. And not make, not forcing their kids to have to, you know, give someone a kiss on the cheek or a hug, if, especially if they don't know them, right? Right. And I, I, I love navigating that, you know, those kind of discussions with parents too, um, because so often we're not taught, like, hey, what okay. the difference between what's okay, you know, with strangers, acquaintances, friends, close friends, family members, yourself, your immediate family. You know, um, what do you what do you feel comfortable with? And so, you know, especially in communities of color, that can be uh, kind of tricky to navigate because, oh, if I if I don't hug you, that's seen as disrespectful. And it is right. like I'm learning that. Like, no, it's not disrespectful. It's I get to choose what I'm comfortable with and I don't feel comfortable hugging you, but I'll, I'll wave at you. I'll give you a fist bump or I'll give you mm -hmm. a five or we can have our own little like, you know, handshake but I don't want to do a full body hug or I don't want to like kiss you on the cheek. And so I do get, a, I, I do get to, I think that's the beauty of like getting to the other side of this, having, getting to navigate that, like not only with my own kids or teenagers now, mm -hmm. but getting, yeah, equipping other parents on how to have those conversations. And, you know, I was that school counselor that was doing social emotional lessons, talking about, you know, what is consent, body autonomy and, you know, as simple as like, oh, well, is it okay if I play with you? Oh, no, okay. And respecting a boundary, like, no, I don't yeah. have to play with you. Or no, we don't have to share this bucket. If I'm not comfortable, I want to be by myself. And so um, I think those were some rewarding moments of like, man, I'm so glad that I decided to like, I, I that I didn't give up, that I didn't, that no, you know, none of those past suicide attempts like went through that I'm, I, I'm breathing, I'm alive so that I'm able to like empower other people because it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, I hear that. <clears throat> so we, I, we probably also have people in our community maybe that are watching or listening that are wondering 
<clears throat> were your parents present, right, when all of this was happening? Like, were they um, aware? Which leads us kind of to my next question. So how did your family and close friends re respond to your experiences of sexual trauma? And um, when and how did they find out? Yeah. Uh, so my mom and my mom went to my final court date last month. And I did ask her that. And I've asked her many times. But I just, you know, I did ask mom, like, mom, did, were you aware, like, of the creepy vibes? Like, did you not, did you pick up anything? And she said, no. I, she just really had no idea. My dad, he worked every single day. They were, you know, they've always had businesses, whether it was, like, in insurance or real estate. And so they were gone a lot of the time, and they just had no idea. And so I actually told my mom when I was 19, and it was, we were having one of her fights. She was berating my sister, and she was slut shaming me. And I had just reached my breaking point with her. And that's when I like, I was yelling at her and I decided like, you know what? Do you know why I'm like this? It's because of what one uncle did to me. And so at that point she was so frozen and she was crying and she texted me yeah. people and said, I will never speak to you again. So that was at 19. Um, I told my dad, I wanted to tell him earlier, but he just, you know, wanted to talk in person and so I got to have this in-person conversation with my dad in 2017 when I went to the Philippines and you know it was a four hour four hour long conversation and it wasn't just about what happened you know the sexual trauma it was about everything yeah I just wanted to have this mm -hmm. whole conversation about like the abuse what, what period or what age were you when you when you had this conversation with your dad on the timeline so you said you told your mom when you were 19? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you were in your 20s already? So with my dad, if that was um, seven years ago, so okay. like 31, 32. Okay. Was this when you were in your grad school years or before yeah. that? Okay. This is in my grad school years. In okay. I... Yeah, I asked him, I asked him every question that I would, had always wanted to ask, like, you know, about the domestic violence, about why he wasn't there. And like, you know, I'm like, I, I wanted you there. Like, why did you cheat on my mom? Like, I, mm. all the questions that I'd, I'd had just boiling in there. Like, I just asked him, um, you know, and it was such an escalating conversation. It was like shouting and then de-escalation and then crying and laughing and, you know, and then all to say that I did, I, I, I finally told him what his cousin had done. And uh, he was like, I'm going to effing kill him. And he was screaming at the top of his lungs. And for some people, that can be really terrifying. But for me, it was like, I felt that so endearing. Like, you know, because like for the first time, I'm like, OK, my dad's going to protect me. He didn't do that. He's not going to do that. This uncle's in jail. Nothing's going to happen. But I just, you know, to... For my for the responses of my parents to like believe me, and so that meant a lot to me. Um, mm. But everybody else, I would say, you know, uh, I don't know if you know this, but in in twenty twenty they changed the rules of when you can come forward and where your perpetrator can be prosecuted in jail. And so there mm. used to be a statute of limitation where you could only come out if it's by your twenty sixth birthday. And they extended it to 40th birthday. So in 2020, when those laws changed, that's when I decided to report this case. Because I knew that this man had kids. And they were the same age as my kids. So that was a haunting fact. And so yeah. I actually, I put my story on social media. So that's how the rest of my family knew. And I got a lot of support. Including her uh, four sisters. Mm -hmm. Is that how also you're, you mentioned your family of five, well, all girls? So your yeah. your four sisters also found out that way? No, I would say this is how my extended family found out. Um, with my sisters, so when we were 14, or when I was 14, 14, 15, um, my grandmother got diagnosed with cancer. And so we were at the hospitals a lot. And there was this moment where... We're waiting in the hospital, and I decided to ask them, like, hey, what's your deepest, darkest secret? And we all, 
admitted to each other that our uncle June had molested us. And we all just started to like compare stories like, no way, what? You too? And so that that was the first time that we found out that he had molested the three of us. He didn't he didn't molest the, the last two. It was just the three of us. And so those are the three. It was me, and my two sisters that we we fought in court for justice and got justice last month. And you said this was during your teenage years when you when you all found out? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, when you sh- exchanged those stories, did you, were they happening at the same time when you were all in the same room or? No. I mean, I get it because you just, you didn't know about each other. No. He, he, he met, that, that was the crazy part. There were so many people in the house. Like how, did, how did he manage to keep this as, how did it keep this under wraps? Um, but this, and you know, and working um, in this area, most of my clients are survivors, and this happens a lot mm-hmm. within families where they keep it under wraps, and it's generationally. You know, it's the uncle, it's the grandpa, it's the family friend, it's the yanga, it's the nanny, and <laughs> it's all happening under the hole. Uh, did you find out, were there other family members outside of your nuclear family that were also victims or maybe aware uh, that this might ha- what were go- what's going on or was most of the family shocked yeah all of the family was shocked they couldn't believe it because you know yeah they couldn't believe it like the persona that my uncle had put like he's just helpful he was like the handyman you know he was the babysitter <laughs> so eh, no and then when when the news got out did your what was your uncle's initial reaction? Um, I when he was crying from what I was told, he was crying, uh, and he actually wrote a letter to me and my two sisters, uh, and it said, you know, I'm sorry for what I did to your understanding, and then he put all three of our names and his name. And so because he did that, that he incriminated him, you know, he pretty much incriminated himself. And that's what got him arrested because then they used that as evidence. When so, you know, September, September 2020, I made the report. Um, and then January 2021, that's when he was arrested. And so he's been in jail ever since. And so uh, when we went to our last court date last month, they sentenced him to 28 years in jail. For oh, wow. And that's, that's, Ew. you know, it, it's an order to even get to that point. And this is what I teach to my survivors. Like, out of a thousand people that come forward, and just think of all the people that don't come forward. Out of a thousand people that come forward and actually report, 13 will make it to, like, okay, we're going to take it on as a case. And out of the 13 that get taken on as a case, seven of those will get can be convicted. Right. So I just think about all the people that don't even come forward. No, right. So we were the one, we were the, you know. Yeah. Um. Was there any news of his, you mentioned he has children, of them also being victims? That we, we don't know. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes when we talk about abuse, when, when we're preparing for this show, um, Emerald, we were talking about also how abusers oftentimes were also victims themselves. Right. And I asked you if, if your uncle was also a victim. And I actually asked him that during, uh, you know, the, my last court date, because, you know, well, on your last court date, you can make a victim, um, victim witness statement, impact statement. And so this is where you get to share the impact of what they did, but also to ask them questions. And that was one of my questions. Like, why? I want to understand you. Why did you do this to me? And it's not that I want to, you know, I'm, I just want to understand you so I can further extend my forgiveness to you because I, I just want to know why. Like, I've been wondering this my, this whole time. And he chose not to answer. So that I, hmm, I'll never know. And um, the legal process, was it a lengthy process 
Um, was there uh, talk a little bit about that? How was it? Um, com were there a lot of complicated hoops to jump through? Oh yeah, I mean, so it was a four year process. They told us it was going to be a year and a half because of the pandemic, and there was a backlog. We had to wait so many times. There are times that we would go to court, or you know. And I wanted to, I wanted to go to court because I wanted to understand what this whole system was, and I wanted to see are they, you know, are they really protecting the survivors or the perpetrators? So I did go to a lot of the court dates, and so it was a lot of continuance, continuance, and so it it was it was so long, it was so long, um, you know, and I just the process it, itself is so traumatizing for the survivors because not right. only do they have to you know, regurgitate their story and they have to answer the questions in so many different ways with the body cam in front of them. They also have to mm -hmm. call the perpetrators to see if they're going to incriminate themselves. So here you are, the survivor, and you're calling your perpetrator to see if they're going to admit on the phone so that they can take that as evidence. Like, that is just wild. Like, and that's still a practice that's used today. You know, and you have to find your own evidence. So it was like, I'm the survivor here and now I have to be my own detective and an investigator and like it, it's it's crazy. Um, so the system is just is definitely not perfect. There's you know a lot of work to be done. Um, yeah. So there's just a and, lot of steps. And when you had to confront your uncle, did he cooperate or did he did he have did he exert his rights? Uh, we didn't get to that point, but. Um, I, you know, there was like this stall. So after the report, there was this stall and they couldn't mm -hmm. find like any evidence. And I just remembered it like, oh my gosh, I remember the letter in 2014 where I saw him at a funeral and I was going through my celebrate recovery program and I used it. I, I, I had my sister take a video of me forgiving him. Mm -hmm. So I think because of that video too. You know, um, he said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And he's crying. And then he ratted to his car. I got to use that video as evidence. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I'm going to switch gears a little bit, Emerald. No. Yeah. Um, but actually bring it back to the details of your story, too. Right now, you're currently a licensed marriage and family therapist. Congratulations Thank on you. your licensure. <clears throat> and you're practicing in the Bay Area, right? Right. Um, you mentioned some of the work that you had to do to help heal yourself from these traumatic experiences as you got older. Um, so a lot of the things that you experienced were these things that your parents, you know, advocated for you and they got you this therapy. Was this something that you did on your own or um, were these recommendations made from adults in your life that that how do you do these different programs? Um, a lot, a lot of it was like self advocacy, you know. Uh, so in high school, yeah, because it's just free counseling. You just you just go up to the, you know, to the wellness center and you get it yourself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when it was Kaiser at that point, I was an adult, so I did that myself. I went into agency so a lot of it was self-advocating for myself unfortunately because my parents didn't know how to get access to these things mm -hmm. um and so but my healing journey with the sexual trauma was like it was quite a wild one because i i i was comfortable doing the healing work around like okay the abuse with my parents i was comfortable doing it around my identity as a you know as an asian woman but like or i was comfortable doing my healing work around my sobriety you know, with from drugs and alcohol, I'll be five and a half years sober this year. You know, I'm five and a half years sober now. But like the sexual congratulations, sexual, thank you, was the most terrifying. And so I did save that to last, and not because I proved mm -hmm. it. Just I was terrified. Like oh, it's a terrifying thing to have to face. And so, yeah, like here I am. I'm doing the work. Like I'm literally helping clients in a community agency, and you know. um, and I'm I'm about to like I'm holding survivor circles for teenagers and my supervisor kind of calls me out. He's like, hey, like whatever we talk about core or whatever we talk about this, the sexual trauma clients that you have, I noticed that you look really sad. Um, 
like, well, because I don't feel, and I told like, I don't feel comfortable pushing my clients to go to court. Like, if they're not ready, they're not ready. Like, I don't want to force them to do anything they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And he said something along the lines of, well, you don't want them to be this 35 year old person that's just like regretting, you know, letting go, letting their repeat offender out there. And I was just like, that's, that was such a milestone because that like broke me. And here I am crying in front of my white supervisor. He's like, oh my gosh, is what, what's happening? What's going on? I'm like, well, because like, that's me. I'm like, I'm the, I'm the 35, you know, um, old woman that's regretting letting, letting this repeat offender out there. And so that's, that's, that was the catapult. Like, okay, I'm ready to face this. Like, I don't want to keep running away from this wound anymore. And so that's when, okay, I'm going to make the report 2021 when all the, you know, AP, API hate crimes against what, you know, against Asians, against women was, were happening. And then you see the Atlanta shootings at the fetishizing of Asian women, you know, then that's when I became like, no, I can't be silent anymore. And so I actually just told my story and it was, I got to be a voice for, you know, API women that experience sexual violence, that experience DV. And then I got to share my personal story. So I'm literally sharing my story for the first time, like on stages. And I'm just like, the trauma waves are hitting so hard. But that, and I wouldn't recommend anyone do that. But like, that's what, that's what I did. I, that's what I did. And, you know, then the following year, I decided like, well, I'm going to just do celebrate recovery again for the third time. And, you know, celebrate recovery is a 10 month program and they meet every week, you know, for two hours and you're pretty much working through your hurts, hangups and habits. And so it's not just like, Oh, drugs, alcohol. It could be like an eating disorder. It could be your sexual trauma. It could be, you know, um, codependency. And so I just said, I want to primarily focus on my sexual trauma. I want to get to a place where I can truly release and forgive these people, not because I condone what they did, but because I want to move on. Like, I don't want to keep holding on to this heavy baggage anymore. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, I put myself in that, you know, and then in um, 2021, when I was going through all the court stuff, I got wow. out to different things like a victim witness advocate. I got, you know, the parent stress line. That's a free stress line that's open 24-7. And mm -hmm. you can, you need someone to just be a safe place to talk to you. You know, I had that, and then I had my individual therapy. So I was, I was getting access to different things so that, because it was just hard. Like, this is something that I had never faced my sexual trauma before. I had never, um, you know, told my story out loud like that. I had never gone to court against my perpetrators. So I, I was trying to use whatever was going to be available to me. Right. And then in 2022, I decided like, I, I want to, I want to join a healing circle for myself, even though I'm holding all these healing circles, like I want for me. And so I found one that was online and it was, it was hard because they don't have it. Like there's no in-person ones in the Bay. I'm, I'm it, me. And I think yeah. that's, that is not okay. I think more in-person healing circles need to be, need to be happening like all over because you know, people are just feeling really isolated and they want connection. They want a network of survivors and they want to hug and they want to, you know, they want to be in a room with real people. And so, but I, I didn't get that. And I, you know, I settled for the online process. Um, and then in 2022, so here I am, like I'm doing all these healing circles. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm speaking at conference and workshops and panels and doing all this stuff and do my own healing work. But if I'm being real with people, like, I still had a lot of the trauma symptoms. Like I still had the racing thoughts. I, I, you know, during intimacy, I still had a lot of the flashbacks. Like I could not be regulated enough to even enjoy intimacy with my husband, which was the saddest thing because I found my guy, I found my person, we have kids together and I can't even enjoy this moment with you. It sucked. And so, you know, I, my husband, he found something that was just so helpful for his journey. And he's also a survivor. And he said, you know, do you want to get like prayers for this? And I'm like, at this point, I don't care what it is. Like, I am just desperate. Like, it's not, I was so angry. I'm like, 
it's not fair. Like, it's not fair that I'm pouring so much of myself. And like, I just want to be healed. And I just want to, I just want to feel free in my own body. Like, I just want to do normal things. I want to, I want to feel safe when I'm just walking down, walking the dog. Like, wh- is that so hard to ask? And so I, you know, I was just open and someone prayed for me. And essentially they're just like, you know, calling things out, like, you know, spirit of trauma, spirit of anger, spirit of unforgiveness, you know, just to, to get these things out of me. And I tell you, like, after one, after one prayer and deliverance session, like I had you, I'm, I just told you all the different types of, you know, services that I, I, I put myself into. And this was after one session, like all those trauma symptoms, like gone. I mean, I had to see the next day and usually I would see like, like pictures of rapists and perpetrators. Like I would get so activated. Like I pretty much had mm. just to like be in the moment and I had intimacy the next day and there was nothing. All I saw were just like lights and clouds. Like I've been able to be like in my body for the first time and to like, like actually feel sensations. Mm-hmm. So it was wild and you know for those that don't know deliverance it's it's a process of being set free from different bondages and it is you know it is um you know for for like believers 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 of jesus christ it's partnering with god and jesus and the holy spirit to like to get these things out of you you know whether it's the trauma the sickness the anger the physical mental manifestations in your body and so for me um, it was a culmination of things. Like I was that desperate to get the healing that I wanted from all of it, not just the sexual trauma, from like everything, everything. Right. Well, I just want to say, Emerald, that um, sharing your story is just healing for so many people in our community that identify with you and are probably also, you know, saying, yeah, me too, right? I mean, we have the Me Too movement, but within our community, there are people that are listening to this episode and saying silently or maybe out loud, Me, me Too. And they're listening to this episode for reasons to find the courage that you've had to navigate this experience and to find healing. And, you know, and we know for our community there's many cultural barriers that um you know maybe get in the way of even discussing this type of a topic you know let alone giving someone the strength to confront it and you've been able to harness your own inner strength in all of this which is respectful inspiring and also giving other people the voice in how to even navigate something that has happened similarly to them and when we talk about some of these cultural barriers like Kia or bringing shame to oneself or family, these are some of the barriers that even silence many of us when we've had similar experiences to the ones that you're describing, right? So when we talk about um, cultural barriers, um, what's your insight on or what's your take on how someone can overcome some of these cultural barriers or stigmas the way you've been able to. I know it it wasn't always easy for you. I know it it's so hard because it's not just like within the Filipino culture, it's a lot of communities of culture. Right. That and, and we have lot- even non Filipinos listening, you know, as well. And so We've always invited, also, I wanted to say, we always have invited other communities to listen to our episodes because they're finding these parallel experiences in their communities, right? So, right. So some of the things that I've noticed is that our, you know, the Filipino community, we're not talking about mental health. We're not talking about what love is. We're not talking about sex. We're not talking about boundaries, body autonomy, or consent. And so if we're not talking about it within our home and then we try to navigate it on our own, it's so confusing because then yeah. you're having to figure it out on your own 
you know, asking your friends or doing your own research or, you know, listening to a podcast. And so I, that's the shift that I've been trying to create in, you know, the, not just like Filipino communities, like all communities that I get, I get a chance to be a voice. Mm -hmm. That these are, these are the type of conversations that we need to have within the family homes because that's where it starts. You know, we're creating this blueprint for how to be and how to show up in the world. And we can't just like, we do think that the schools are going to teach it. Do you think that your friends are going to teach it? Like, we need to have these, you know, they can be uncomfortable, but they're very necessary conversations that we need to have. I and mean, when I think another barrier is that, like I mentioned before, you know, so often the sexual trauma is happening within the family unit, you know, whether it's like an auntie, an uncle, an older cousin or a family friend or the yaya or the neighbor. And so like, yeah, we begin to do that. And then so then our secrets are just killing us inside by holding on to it. And, you know, we're carrying on to burdens and shames that are just were never meant for us to hold on to because they've been projected onto us, you know, and then the other barriers, like just the lack of guidance, like how do you begin to even bring this up? There's where is the manual for that? Like, how do you bring it out? And what I'd say is like you don't do it alone. I mean, mm -hmm. I definitely didn't do it alone. Even when I was doing my court process, or even when I was sharing my story on the stage, is like I, what I realized, like there's so much healing within the community, um, and that's why I like to do healing circles in community because then it's less scary, and so it's like navigating. Well, who are the safe people? Are there safe people within your friend circles? Are there safe people within your your pockets of community? Are there safe people within your family that you could start to practice sharing these parts of yourself so that you're not alone in this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because it's really confusing. It's this whole concept of like sex is so confusing and you wonder why there's so many issues around it because they get conflicting perspectives around what do the schools say? What do your friends say? What does the culture say? What does the religion say? What does your family say? All of the message are so conflicting. And then you wonder why, like, how come I'm having such difficulty with intimacy and not just sexual intimacy, emotional intimacy, physical intimacy, because you're getting such conflicting views. And so I would say, you know, um, find the safe people. Like, who are those safe people so that you can start to, un you know, unravel and, un and unveil like who you are and what you're going through. And that way, it feels just a little bit safer to do it in a bigger scale. Uh, you know, Emerald, another thing that I heard you say was that your husband was also a victim. And um, I think that's important to also bring out in this episode because women are not always the only or female identified individuals. They're not always the only victims in this so did your experience also influence your husband's advocacy with what he had also experienced yeah i mean he just started to share his story like two years ago mm -hmm. because, and some of the things that i hear from like not only from my husband but other male clients or even male friends that have opened their story with me like well it's not that big of a deal. Well, it's not as bad as this. There's a lot of comparison. Well, what is it going to matter if I say it out loud? Nothing's going to happen anyway. And so there's a lot of like dismissing and just covering it. In... So you, you found that different between your male and uh, identifying and female identified clients? Yeah, I think... I mean, it's it's already hard to come out with what happened, but I think it's it is it has been much easier for, you know, people who identify as female to come out. Because mm -hmm. when we do all this, we have the Me Too movement. We have more and more women that are coming out with their stories. That's not the case for men. It's it's kind of terrifying because, you know, they're they have to be like strong, they have to be the protectors, or you know, these are the messages that messages that they're given. And how terrifying is it for them to say, hey, it was a female that did this to me? 
or or even a male. Yeah, in some cases, yeah, yeah. So, I wanted to ask you, Emerald, what were your first steps in confronting this the silence and the pain? I mean, I know many people in our community. I mentioned I mentioned earlier have similar stories, you know, as yours, and maybe they're listening to this to figure out how to even begin or embark on this path towards healing. You mentioned that a lot of this was self-initiated, a lot of the support that you sought. At what point were did you realize that you needed to get help and where did where did you even begin? Like how did you start that journey of saying, hey, I need help and this is where I should start first? Hmm. I mean, are you talking in terms of my sexual trauma or like what, or mm-hmm. just in general? Let's uh, let's go in general because I, uh, and then we can hone in on your sexual trauma. Yeah. I, it actually wasn't me now that, now that you're bringing it up, it actually wasn't me that self-initiated. So um, my very first relationship when I was 14, and I think he just, he didn't, and he was actually the, other than my sister's, he was the first person outside of my family that I told what happened to me. And so he did witness like how depressed I was. And he did witness like that I used to, you know, engage in a lot of self-harm and cutting. And he didn't notice that I had a lot of suicidal thoughts and he just didn't know what to do. And it was actually him that brought me to the counseling first, you know, and where I got to meet my first counselor, Sandra. And she was half black, half Filipino, and she had a Wallis on her walls. So I was like, yeah, we're cool. You're my, you're my therapist. Um, so, and she was the first one to teach me the word rape and sexual abuse. And yeah, like, I, I love Sandra. I mean, uh, I love Sandra so much. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So, so for some people, like, you know, if they're lucky enough to have a loved one and right advocate for them. Do you have any like advice um for people that want to take their own journey towards healing? Like at what point, you know, should they know, hey, this is like a sign, right? That they I mean, you also have clients that that are, you know, dealing with similar experiences. What are some of their stories and when they knew that they needed to um, take that step towards getting help and healing. I think through what I've noticed, it's it's a lot of these adults, you know, that they thought, like, if I just move forward and I just, you know, just keep moving on and I just keep pursuing my career, my college, it's going to be fine. And what they're noticing is that some of the symptoms, that just, they're not going away. You know, they're feeling like irritable agitated the nightmares are still there they're not feeling settled they're like they're chronically activated because they don't feel safe and they feel like they need to protect themselves even with you know with with their significant others or um you know they haven't been able to have like regular bowel movements or you know so or intimacy is just so painful because they're having like you know vaginismus which is like tightness um, mm-hmm. Or, so they say they'd have moved on, but they're experiencing all these like physical and emotional uh, symptoms in their life. It, despite, right. so and th- and this was their like sign of like, hey, th- I need to do something about this. Right, right. Because I think so often people just like they put in the box and they think like if I just put in the box and forget about it and just like, you know, eventually it's going to go away. It doesn't go away. It, it, we just need to safely unbox it and, you know, kind of work through all the different things like, hey, what are what are the lies that I believed about myself that are just absolutely not true? They don't belong in my self-belief system. Mm-hmm. You know, what are the... um the narratives that I believe that were fed to me, you know, that are impacting the way that I view life. 
hmm, you know, what, what are the boundaries that were wrong from me? Like, and started to take, you know, to ground in those truths and, you know, start to un undo a lot of the harm that was done to you. Hmm. So, Emerald, you also mentioned that when you were starting to find healing within this process, you joined a online healing circle. I know that there are members throughout our diaspora that are listening to this episode and trying to find, like you mentioned, a physical space to even gather to talk about these experiences and heal from them. Do you want to mention maybe what that um, online healing circle was you know obviously there's mine in person in the bay but the online one yeah um, is kayleen khan oh i love her so much yeah kayleen khan k-a-l-e-n-e and her last name is k-h-a-n and so she's been she's also another therapist that has been doing these healing circles and also a fellow survivor and so that's why i, I chose her Mm, so folks can just kind of Google Kayleen Khan and they'll probably find that healing circle. Yep. Okay. It's one of the few circles that she does. I know the other thing, the other one she does is like on, I think, perfectionism or you know, mm. burnout. And so, but sexual trauma is also her jam too. Okay. Now you've been able to transform your experience in a way that you're now offering help to other survivors of sexual trauma within your practice as a LMFT, right? Through your collective healing circles. Tell us more about that process and what it entails. Yeah. I mean, so it, I, I created this 12 week curriculum and really it's like my gift to the community. It's like everything that I've always wanted in my own healing journey. Cause I've been through so many, like I told you, Kaiser community agencies, like, you know, open-ended groups, closed-ended groups. And so these are just things like, man, I wish that I would have had this in my own healing journey. And so this isn't, any, it wasn't anything that I experienced. I just wanted to give it. And so in the first week, I call it like our dream circle because, you know, so often as survivors, it's terrifying to dream because then what if it doesn't happen? Or am I even allowed to dream? Um, mm -hmm. What are the possibilities? All I know is how to do is survive. And so we get to dream out loud. We get to draw it out, write it out and share it from other people to inspire each other of, Hey, I've, I've always wanted to go to school. I've always wanted to move out of state or I've always wanted to be in a relationship or I've always wanted to just like hike a hill, you know, or sometimes small things. I've always wanted to learn how to ride a bike. Like, you know, we get to see that. Like, I want to be a DJ. And so we, incur, you know, or I want, I want to write a book. I'm, a, I'm an author in the making. And so there's been a lot of people who've like launched podcasts or wrote their poetry books or or the process of writing their books that come out of these healing circles because like, you know, like they have their route of survivors that believe in them. And so they're just going to do it, you know? And then the second week is showing them. And I always use, I, I love Canva. I always like using visuals. <laughs> we're using visuals. Yeah. We're using the whiteboard. We're using movement. I, I use all types of stuff. It's not just talk there because I don't believe in that. I think you need to use, I think you need to honor all the different ways that your brain processes information and your lived experiences. And so- mm -hmm. There's a lot of like writing, uh, writing, physical activities, dance, um, you know, uh, drawing and, and authentic sharing and so screening. And so um, every week is a different theme. The second week is the impacts of trauma. So we talk about all the different ways that sexual trauma, trauma can impact, you know, your relationships, your sense of safety, um, the way that you've adapted, hope. Oh, you know, maybe you've used uh, substances or food to kind of like deal with the pain or, you know, or even even how you, your awareness around safety. Like for me, I didn't even have those alarms. You know, like when something dangerous is about to happen, you have your alarms. Mm -hmm. You have like, you start to feel the pricklies or you start to feel activated. I, I didn't have that. And so I found myself repeating these same patterns. And for some people, it's like, it's very hyper alert. Like everything seems dangerous now. So it's really hard to even just exist in the world. And so you, you tend to isolate. So there's like this spectrum, right? Um, so we talk about all the different ways, you know, that people can be very aversive to sex or very hypersexual or, you know, hey, how come I'm getting chronic body pain or how come I'm, uh, 
it's hard for me to speak up. I used to be such a social butterfly and now I it's hard for me to even put a sentence together or even draw a boundary with my boss. And so we talk about the different impacts. And then, you know, week three is owning your story. And so this is, I tell people, like, this is the hardest part of the, the whole journey because we write out our story. So they have a week to, you know, to, to write out what happened. And so they're talking about, like, their the name of the perpetrators, what happened to them, the environmental factors that led to it. Um, you know, how has it impacted the different areas of your life and, uh, you know, how do you want to shift your narrative in a way that empowers you and the people around you? And so they're writing out their story and then they share it out loud with the fellow survivors the next week. You know, and we go through each week is, okay, now we're healing in the body, healing in the mind, freedom of, mm-hmm. freedom of letting go. Because sometimes the word forgiveness can be so triggering and so activating. And so, you know, whether you want to use release or letting go or forgiveness, it's not con- condoning what they did but it's like i'm i've been holding on to this big baggage and i don't want to do it anymore. i just i i want to let my light because i deserve to and mm. you know starting to ground yourself well what are my new boundaries what is a boundary i used to say like we're gonna work on boundaries and then they're like what's a boundary I'm like okay i need to back it up emerald i can't assume yeah. that is like stop so yeah you know and then starting to make aligned choices i mean Choices that are aligned with your values versus mm-hmm. the people pleasing and like going along with whatever it else is to work really and standing firm on that. Right. And then, you know, I go through the family tree exercise where we dissect your family tree. We write it out and we look mm-hmm. at, okay, what are all the things that go running through that bloodline? You know, um, medical things, emotional um, patterns and, you know, parenting, marriage. We look, we look at all that bloodline and we, we start to see, well, okay, those are the things I can honor and I can acknowledge that this happened. And here's some me generational patterns that I would like to start doing, starting with me. And who knows, maybe I can make an impact with my cousins or my parents or, you know, the the goal isn't to to change the whole family tree. It's just like you start with you and, you know, it could be a ripple effect. Maybe not with your family tree, maybe with your friends. And then really assessing your supports. And so I created this whole, like, it was like 10 questions and you're kind of assessing your supports like well are they um are they emotionally supported do i feel energized around them am i motivated to be around them do they uh do they challenge my growth in some in some aspect of my life and so you start to look at hey who are the people around me and are they really what i need are they supportive and so it's not me telling you you're assessing for yourself and so and then how do you create that? Like, how, what if there's nobody? How do you start to cultivate that? And so we talk about those. And then, you know, we start to explore, like, all the different messages that we got around romance and sex. Like, hey, what did the schools tell us? What did our friends tell us? What did we get from music and books? What did we learn in our family upbringing? What did we learn from our culture? That's not always Filipino culture. It's it, some, There's a lot of, hey, we're, we're a mix of different cultures. And what did what was the messages around that? And then mm-hmm. grounding yourself, like, well, what, what, what is true for you? Like, how do you want to operate in romantic relationships? How do you want to flip the dating scripts? Like, what would you like intimacy to look like? And for a lot of people, like, they don't know what that is because this is what they've known. They've known, you know, trauma, dissociation, performative, or just like numb or, you know, just triggers. And so then, how do you begin to shift of, you know, honoring what your body needs and then getting to a point where, hey, I can have embodied infancy. I could be in my body. I can be in touch with my sensations. I can have a choice and who I get to have access to me. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. So, and then, you know, the last thing is we get to celebrate and I let them pick the celebration. Some of them, they want to have a picnic in the park. Some of them, they want to have a pollock in the office. Some of them, um, one of them, they want to do a break room. So we did a break room and we ranged out and another one, we did ax throwing. So I let them pick and then we all celebrate together our journey. And so that's our, that's my 12 week. Wow. That is so cool. Thank you for sharing that process. I'm, um, and I'm going to ask you at the end, you know, for, um, people that are like, how do I sign up or where do I sign up? Or, Don't worry. We're going to get, um, to that 
question. Hang on, you know, stay on with us. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you, Emerald, you're a parent now. And how, you said you mentioned you have two kids? Yeah, I have 14. And, yeah, they're teenagers. Crazy. <laughs> so given what you've experienced, um, cause, because I'm sure we also have parents that are listening to this episode. What are some things that you've instilled in them to protect them and prevent them from ever having experience, you know, having to not experience anything that you have, you and both your, your spouse have experienced? Yeah. And you know what? I, I didn't do perfect. I was a very hyper vigilant parent because like I said, like I didn't start the healing journey with my sexual trauma until 2020. And so, uh, I did a lot of things out of fear and I would have done differently. Like, um, but this is, I'm just going to share, be very vulnerable about how I did it. You know, when they were two, they were in daycares. So I can't be there to protect them. So that is when I taught them what good touch and bad touch was. You know, I did let them know. Sometimes there are scary and tricky people out there that might not want to protect you. And sometimes they are the teachers and sometimes they are the coaches and sometimes they are, you know, they can be the pastors or a, the family friend. Mm -hmm. And so I taught them like, who, who is, you know, who's okay to touch your, you know, your help you in the bathroom or touch your pen parts. Like if it's okay, if, if it's the doctor and they're examining and they're just going to look that's it. But I'm going to be in the room. So they, they knew, you know, start, they start to get that information at age two. And then every single year I would, you know, d um, depending on their age and their stage and their development, then I would give them a little bit more information. And so, yeah. you know, when they were in, I taught them about, about, about boundaries. I bought books about consent and boundaries. There's a ton on Amazon, you know, mm -hmm. and then there's even a, a book on a book about, on sexual trauma and that's that's for kids like there's little kid books um when they're in elementary school i i taught them about megan's law and i showed them how to navigate that website you know we live right next to a school but man we saw all those little chicken pox dots on the screen of the different perpetrators that were within a half mile radius so i did teach them that because you know we need to be aware of our surroundings um, in middle school, I did give them the little whistleblowers. So it's, it's like a little where you pull it and then it alerts like, if, you know, that you're in danger and you can just run. And so they did have that. Um, you know, I, when they got phones in high school, yeah, I want your I want your locations on at all times. Like you need to be like an open, honest communications. You know, we had a lot of talks about you know, what are healthy relationships? What we talked about sex, we talked about mental health. Like I was, a, I was such an open book when it came to my own journey and my healing journey. So there's no like, oh, TMI, like they knew. I mean, they could ask me anything and I'll, I'll answer it to my best of my ability. And if I don't know, like, I don't know, babe, we need to Google, okay? Or ask Siri, we need to do some research because I don't know. So like, that's the type of mom that I was. I'm just, like, very involved, very open. Um, yeah. And then um, for our community that may not be in the U.S., maybe if you could explain what Megan's Law is. Megan's Law is a website where, well, when someone is a, it's it's a website where they have, like, all the registered sex offenders. So if you commit a crime and then, you you know, you have to get on that list. And then um, you, it shows, you know, their picture, the the types of crimes that they were convicted of and their location. And so because the community needs to be aware of their, you know, they also deserve to be aware because then it also alerts parents, um, hey, do I want to live there? Or do I want to hang around there? It's, yeah. Right. So parents that uh, maybe might be hearing this for the first time just you can just google i'm sure megan's law and then you can search shoot the, your area now we're coming to the end of the episode emerald um being that we're a wellness podcast we typically like to also ask our guests what their wellness routines and self-care practices consist of i mean you've talked about the various modalities um throughout the episode that have 
helped you to heal from not only sexual trauma, but compounded abuse and trauma. You mentioned domestic violence, right? You also even mentioned physical abuse, emotional, and, you know, and sexual trauma. Um, I know that you also run a fitness and therapy business in partnership with your spouse, Nick. Um, tell me more about that and what your current wellness routines or self-care practices look like. Yeah, I mean, last year, uh, we opened up our, I opened up my private practice, been doing the mental health game like since 2016. And, you know, during the pandemic, we realized like, man, it's so interconnected because sometimes I would be in my therapy room, my Zoom room, and mm -hmm. we're not talking, we're doing physical activities because they just, they needed to get it out. And then I noticed, like, are they are they even doing personal training in there? All like, I don't I don't hear any movement. And they're like, they're literally just having a on like hour long conversation. And so like we decided to like blend both of our worlds, where you know I literally have a gym, you know we have our gym, we have the five therapy rooms, and we do marriage classes and workshops, and I do healing circles. So it's like you know healing in the mind, body, soul, and healing not only for individuals, but for, for relationships and for families. And so we just, I, we're like such a systems type. <laughs> so your spouse is a personal trainer. Yeah. So he's a okay. personal trainer. But he says like, no, I'm a therapist too. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to, he, he is, they, they literally tell him everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what do you, what are you currently doing for, what are your own wellness and self-care practices and men, uh, months running a business, being a mom, being a spouse, you know, um, being a devotee to your church, right? Being a uh, running a, you know, healing circle. Where, how do you find time for your own wellness? And what does that look like? Yeah, I had to create a schedule that works for me. So my first client will be 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock so that I have that big morning bulk to do what I need to do. And so, um, you know, and the first thing when I get up in my morning, I always, like, I'll have my, uh, it's like, you know, my morning devotionals or like my morning prophetic declares. And it's, you know, I'm declaring these things over my life. I'm praying these things over my life. And so the book is called Heavenly Decrees. And so I have my time with God because, like, I don't want to go on my phone and just doom scroll. I, I, that's not the first thing that I want. Like, I'm not getting all this energy from myself. Like, I have to get energy from my source. Which for me, it's it's God, it's Jesus. And so I have to tap in with him first because he's the one that gave me, like, all this energy and creativity and the means to do these things and to, the capacity to hold space and the grace to, to be able to hold on to these different stories because I know that everybody is graced for that. Everyone has a different you know, calling or purpose in their life. So one, I have to have my time with God. And then, you know, I walk my dog Faith. She's a Frenchie. And, you know, that's like the time sometimes like it's not always like, oh, I'm just watching my dog. Like sometimes I'm crying on those walks. Literally. Sometimes I'm like, just like cr I'm crying. Sometimes I'm, um, you know, or I'm just like, I'm just grateful. Like, wow, there's so many times like I should not be here, but I'm literally like, I see the breath coming out of my, my mouth that I'm walking this dog and like, look at the pretty skies. Like I'm literally just being so grateful for everything. Like I have working fingers. I have working toes. Mm. I can, I can literally, I see, I see the cars going by. I see this beautiful sunrise. Like, you know, I just, I start my day like that. Um, you know, then I have my physical activities. So with my kids, like, I have to get so creative. Like, how can I spend time with them? And so mm -hmm. I joined the boxing gym with them in January because I'm like, I, I, I cool. just want to, how can we spend time together? And I don't want to be the, that mom just sitting and waiting for them to be done with their class. Like, a, no, I want to do it with them. And it feels so good. It feels like I'm not one of those girls like, okay, let's take five deep breaths and like, you know, ground ourselves. Like, no, I want to go at it at the, uh, on the punching bag. I will I love me a kickboxing class, the boxing classes or the little boot camps where you just feel like you're just dead on the floor, you know, waiting for someone to collect yourself. Like, I love that. Um, yeah. You know, so I do that with them like two to three times a week. And then on Fridays, I hula. And so I love hula because it's just like, 
it's not the Tahitian. It's the slow mm -hmm. where you're telling stories with your hands. And that is like my perfect way to end a Friday because it's like, it's just like everything just melts into that halal. And, you know, I just, I love being around my whole sisters. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't have to tell them about what's going on in my life. I just, just being around them and dancing with them. Like I feel, you know, very connected with my body and with, with my sisters and, you know, and then we have a gym. So yeah, I will get, I will throw down on the weight training because I love me a good deadlift. Like it just, weight training makes me feel so strong and I love it. I love grunting. I love roaring. I love, yeah, I just do like CrossFit stuff. It's just, you know, I love aggressive workouts. Uh, and so, but I'm also like, I'm mindful. Like before when I was such a people pleaser and I just, I was so desperate for love and attention. I, everybody and anybody could get access to me. And then when I like learned to not do that and I just became real with who I am and what I need, I'm very mindful like who, what gets access to me, like which family members get to spend time with me, which friends I allow, you know, in my space and, and, and how much time I can give. Um, the events that I choose, I don't just say yes to every single event. I'm very mindful. I, I you know, have kind of to feel it out. Like, mm -hmm. is it, do I have capacity for it? Do I have the energy for it? Like, is it going to be better for sure? And, you know, can I, can I handle it? Um, yeah. I made sure that I had very fueling connections and not just like these fake, fake friend me is like, no, I don't have time. Like, I don't, I don't have time to deal with that. So I'm very mindful. And I'm also like, I'm very mindful of what I allow in my mind because I'm really sensitive. And so, you know, the books that I read, the sermons, you know, anything, even if it's like an educational workshop or podcast, I'm very mindful of what I put into my mind because it needs to be growing and fueling for me. It can't just have junk because it, it just, for me, it doesn't feel good anymore. Like I, I can't mindlessly binge. Like I, it doesn't feel good for me anymore. Maybe that's what I did in my twenties. Like I just, I just don't like it. And nature like, I try to get that in. Like, obviously, I do it during my walks. But, like, I try to get in, like, at least a couple hikes in the month. Uh, because in the Bay, there's just so many different ones. Like, you can, like, 15 minutes. So beautiful. Hike. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I do. But the important is, like, making a schedule that works for me. And, you know, I am able to do that now because I own my business. But before, like, I was at the hands of corporate. And so, mm -hmm. it used to be part of the hustle and grind and having you know, your main job and then your side hustle. And like, I learned the hard way that doesn't work. I landed myself in the hospital because of dehydration and vertigo. And, you know, so then I learned I'm, I'm not, I'm never going to put myself in that predicament. It's, I can't. So that's why I created my schedule in, in this way where, you know, my first appointments to help a client is 11 or 12. And then, you know, I'll go into like, um, six and it's not all the way straight through there's breaks um, and then I end my day with connection with my family and so where we get to be silly we get to play games and yeah even though they're teenagers like I still want to play games I still like to they still like to roast each other they still like to joke like you know just yeah and down with those teenagers or sometimes they don't want to talk and I just want to be in their presence or just cuddle with the dog like I just end my day with connection so like starting my day with God self-care helping some people and then end the day of connection that's that's kind of my that's that's a formula wow. that works for me it's beautiful emerald as we begin to close how can our community find more about your healing circle and if they have additional questions how can they contact you yes um i mean so my email is emerald at setfreetherapy.org uh, you can look me up on Inclusive Therapist, Psychology Today, and Therapy Den. You can follow me on Instagram, Heal with Emerald. So, and then I think that Cheryl will be sharing, you know, you can share my card, my, my phone number as well. Okay. Um, and then also, where do they find more about your um, healing circles? Yeah. And so if if you go on Inclusive Therapist and, and Psychology Today, It'll it'll share all the information and then ways to sign up. And so um, they would just have to set up an initial consultation. And uh, I will be I will be exploring the online because there's a lot of people online that, you know, they can't come to the Bay. They're from the way north or the way south of Cali. And so I am going to be 
for doing that for the next round for online. Okay. And your business is also in San Jose? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So it's San Jose Bay Area, California. All right. Final words. Is there anything else that you would want our community throughout the diaspora to know when it comes to healing from sexual trauma? You're not alone and you are so loved and you're so worthy. And to just to get in community with other people, we're out there. I thought I was alone and I thought that I was navigating and you know, you're navigating all this on your own. But like once you take that bold step of sharing it, you realize like, oh my goodness, there is a, a whole army of survivors everywhere. And you don't have to navigate this healing journey alone. Beautifully said. Thank you, Emerald, for this extremely courageous conversation with our community about healing from sexual trauma and and launching our fourth season with such a very powerful topic. Um, We thank you for your courageous transparency, honesty, and inspiring journey, not only towards healing yourself, but also your dedication to the healing of other survivors of sexual trauma. I am personally in awe and deeply humbled by your committed passion And we look forward to witnessing your journey unfold and supporting your work in the process. And to our community, our next episode of Season 4 will be on another amazing group in the Bay Area, Sweet Mango Therapy Group, one of the first Filipina-owned group therapy practices in California. This episode will air on Wellness Wednesday, May 15th, just in time for Mental Health Awareness Month. As we close, we'd like to acknowledge once again our guest speaker, Emerald Rubio, our graphic designer and beat maker for our opening and closing track, Richie, our advisors, Allison De La Cruz, Rian De Los Reyes, and Safo Tialogo, our community partners, This Filipino American Life, and all of our community members for your shares and support. As always, we'll share more about our guests' offerings on our Instagram stories and highlights for permanent access with any of their upcoming events. Be sure to follow us at Philippine X and Wellness on Instagram, Threads, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, and on X at Philippine X, the letter N, well, followed by the letters N and S. Don't forget to continue to hit like and subscribe on our Philippine X and Wellness YouTube channel. Thank you always for believing in us. Be well, everyone. Continue to take care of yourselves in each and at each other. Dagang salamat. All right, salama. Bye. Thank you.